What's up, family? Thank you so much for tuning in for today's episode of the Recovered on Purpose show. The Recovered on Purpose show is sponsored by all the students who signed up to add purpose, meaning, and joy to their lives in recovery with the Recovery Speaker Share Your Story Powerfully course. Today's student shout-out goes to Krista Barnes. Krista has been dedicated to changing her life through personal development and is preparing her incredibly powerful story with a message to serve survivors of sex trafficking and to help teens and parents of teens avoid falling victim to these horrible crimes. I'm super proud of you, Krista, and I can't wait to help get this story out. If you have a story of addiction and recovery you want to learn how to make impact and income with, Follow the link in the pinned comment to book your one-time, 100% free call with me so we can strategize exactly how you can do it. Enjoy the show and keep living Recovered on Purpose. The black represents the darkness from which we came. The white represents the light in which we now live. And the red represents the passion it takes to live Recovered on Purpose. What's up, everyone? Thank you so much for being here for Guest Sundays. Guys, I am super excited for this conversation. I've got Courtney Anderson here today, and we're going to have an incredible conversation about recovery, about passion and purpose in recovery, and how she helps women find sobriety. So Courtney Anderson describes the best day of her life as August 18th, 2012. And she says, that is the day I finally stopped the madness of addiction and started to do some real living. Courtney is a cheerleader for women looking to change their relationship with alcohol, supporting them to thrive, not just survive without it. As the founder of National Sober Day, host of the Sober Vise podcast, a sober coach and author, Courtney has helped thousands of people find more freedom going alcohol free. Guys, without further ado, here's Courtney. Huh? Courtney, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Adam, for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you today. Absolutely. I'm excited too. And it, you're doing so many things in recovery to help others. And that's that's what this show is about, is about lifting up the recovery community to get out and live on purpose, live on mission, to go help addicts out there suffering. So tell us a little bit about your, your story, why it is that you're doing what you're doing, kind of where your alcoholism and addiction led you. <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, it led me to the pits of hell. <laughs> Um, it, it led me to what was supposed to be my story, right? It led me to finally saying enough was enough. Um, I got to the end of my, my active addiction where it was just to the point, you know, I was drinking maybe once or twice a week, but when I drank, there was no, there was no off and it, it would go very heavy. And then I would be in like a three day, you know, figuring out like, okay, this hangover is a three-day hangover and then going through the shame cycle, the anxiety, and then coming out of it, then I start functioning, doing what I need to, and then the reward system kicks in and it's like, oh, okay, it's cool. It's time to go get messed up, right? So I was in that cycle. So when it was my time, when the time presented itself and the universe finally stepped in to being like, this is enough, enough, I was, I was tired. I was good and tired and I was exhausted at 29 years old, you know, because I had been trying from 25 to 29 to what is called now, you know, moderate or the sober curious or whatnot. Like I was trying to put, I, try, I tried putting all these rules and like, I'm not going to take shots. I'm not going to drink dirty martinis. I'm not going to drink Jameson because God, it's really the whiskey that messes me up. You know, <laughs> I mean, all of those excuses or, oh, I can go a week without drinking. I don't have a problem. But what I ignored for so long was what I knew at 25 when my soul told me, like, there's one day you're going to have to give up drinking. I, I had this conversation with myself. And then 29, you know, I was I was six weeks shy of being 30. I lost my rescue cat for a second time. Um, my boyfriend at the time was like, yo, you can continue doing this, but I'm not going to be with you if you continue drinking. We were in a relationship at that point, a year and a half. And I made a pact to the universe that day. And I said, you know, if I find my cat, I will give the sober thing a go. And sure shit, I found my cat three days later. And that boyfriend is now my husband. So you know, it's it's just one of those things where I had that moment, and I think everyone does. When I finally found that cat, it was like the world got silent, and my answer came. 
And mm. that answer finally came, you know, and, and it showed up in a eight pound four legged friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and since then, um, in August 18th, I'll have 10 years and I'm really for this. Thank you. This one, I'm so, this one might actually be the one that I have like the emotional ugly cry breakdown because I have specifically, I don't want to say I have waited for this day, but intuitively I have because it was, that was the number of years I was in that active relationship with alcohol was 10 mm. years. And now it's just like, okay, to have 10 years sober, like, you know, I'm doing this and I have been doing this, but 10 years just to me is a little bit special because I am overcoming that 10 years of the active addiction. If, right. if that, if that kind of makes sense. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I did a little bit of 12 steps in the beginning and it didn't, didn't resonate for me. Then I did some white knuckling, uh, those first few years. And then I got really big into personal development and meditation and then going back to therapy, participating in the program and what out of those years came then was eventually starting my own Sober Vibes community. And it is what it is to this day, because at that time in my sobriety and recovery, this is something I needed. And it was more of an empowerment support really meeting people with where they're at because everybody is always at a different stage mentally right. um, in their in their sobriety and just being more of a cheerleader to someone rather than, um, you know, rather than coming from a place of shame and this is how it's done. And, you know, mm. so I, I'm not, I'm not one for shaming because yeah. it doesn't do anybody good, yeah. you know, and especially in recovery. And I've spoken out loud about my own sobriety and recovery journey 30 days in because there was something there that I saw where I'm like, I'm not going to continue to live in the shadows and in secret, secret, hush, hush, let's sweep this under the rug because I did that for 10 mm. years. Yeah. I needed to set my soul free. So that's why I, I have been loud and proud about it since Amen. 30 days in. Amen. And that's that's what we're all about here. That's mm -hmm. I mean, us sharing our stories and we're going to get into how that's helped you in your recovery and what you mean by cheerleading for women yeah. and everything like that. I do have a couple questions about about your story. So okay. do you think um, do you think that cat might have been called by the universe yeah. or been like a piece of of your story that was set up not just by you? Oh my God, 100%. 100%. You know, I, I, I truly do believe that Fiona Again, she was a rescue animal. My friend had called me, found this cat uh, uh, roaming around in the streets in the winter time, and you know, I, I was like, "Yeah, you know, let me talk to my boyfriend. We'll take her in." And you know, he was not about it because he never had a cat before. I was like, "I will do all of it. I will," <laughs> you know. So yes, one hundred percent. I I think I I know for a fact that people are people and things are brought into our life because that's what the universe had planned yeah. and Fiona is still here with me to this day. Amen. Amen. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. I just had a show uh, a couple of weeks ago with a guy that got a doctorate. His dissertation was on that exact thing, like signs from God, signs from, you know, uh, your purpose, things that show up in your life that you're supposed to take action mm -hmm. on. Yes. And what was that feeling that you got? So you, you made a pact Yes. with with your higher power with the universe yes. that yes you were going to try sobriety if you found this cat right yes. yes and so obviously it meant a lot to you the cat means a lot to you mm -hmm. what was that feeling like when you when the cat came into your life came back into your life mm -hmm. and you know you have to abide by this promise that you made to the universe now what mm -hmm. did that feel like and what were you thinking I was overwhelmed with emotion because when I went outside for like the hundredth time in that three day period to be like, Fiona, you know, like yeah. call for this cat <laughs> on the back porch, you know, and then all of a sudden she comes out from my neighbors, uh, underneath their porch. And yes, I looked there plenty of times. Like I, yeah. and she comes out and this cat has like cobwebs in her little whiskers oh. and like leaves in her hair, you know? She's actually sitting over on, on her little stoop right yeah. now. But um, so I walk to get her and this, she just like, seriously, like runs up to me. I drop to my knees 
And when I say that the world stopped, I'm not kidding. It mm. was like one of those super slow mo moments. And then it like I snapped and I, I couldn't hear anything. It's like everything went silent. Yeah. And I, you know, I dropped to my knees and then she peed on me. And then that's like snapped <laughs> me out of like that, that two second that I had a connection with something greater than me. Mm. Now let's not get this twisted. <laughs> I was never a person of, of God. You know, mm. I was, all, I grew up with a very spiritual mother. So I always mm. believed in the spiritual sense, but in that moment, my higher power at that time was being brought through with this little cat. Yeah. And oh. I think, I think that's amazing. I think that's mm -hmm. how, that's how God works. He works yeah. through everything from animals to, you know, yeah. even a flyer flying through the air and hitting you in the leg that tells you what to do. You know, we never know. Right. right. Another exactly. question I have. Your boyfriend at that time mm -hmm. basically made some kind of ultimatum, right? Mm -hmm. And I've and I'm in recovery, and I've had these hard conversations with mm -hmm. loved ones of addicts, right? Yeah. Like uh, last month, I was having a conversation with with a girl that I've known for a long time, and she just found out that her boyfriend was, you know, using meth, mm -hmm. and you know, he's been hiding it a little bit, kind of lying about it now and that kind of stuff. And then I, I dive into, you know, how long have you been with him mm -hmm. and ask some certain questions. And I got to a place where me as someone who was a meth addict and a heroin addict at mm -hmm. different points in my life, um, I recommended to her the same thing, like not to be around this person because it's only going to get deeper and deeper. And if you're, yeah. if you're going to commit, you have to know what you're committing to. Right. Yeah. So, what did that do for you to have him say that to you in that moment? Did it did it cause you to feel like not worthy or not good enough? Or did it feel make you feel empowered for anybody out there that has like a boyfriend or a girlfriend that's struggling with this stuff? Would you suggest that? Look, I know because there is a lot of this. The answer is yes. The answer is flat out yes. There's a lot of talk that the ultimatives don't work. Mm -hmm but everybody is different yeah. you know there was a there's a show on, on netflix with uh david letterman has a talk show on there and he was interviewing robert downey jr and robert downey jr said he, it was kind of similar and he was like for people like me the ultimatum worked yeah. and it's the same thing because his girlfriend who, wife is just did the same thing pretty much yeah. just like you got to get your act together i'm out of here yeah. and i think for certain people it just works and the thing before what like I don't know what it's like to go to I had never had the opportunity nobody ever came to me and was like you need to stop drinking nobody right. ever did I did not have the like here is your 30-day rehab like I would love to go to rehab now just to check it out to see what it's all about right <laughs> like, honestly <laughs> but I never had that so this was the first I had friends get mad at me and then I am the I am the personality type was the personality type back then where a lot of I mean so many people loved me and then it just became enabled you know yeah. and it was in my in my active addiction where that manipulation was of that of me being like no no I'll, I'll never do this again I'll never do this again and then of course like two weeks later there we were yeah. um so I didn't have that so for me it worked it yeah. doesn't work for everybody yeah. It doesn't. That's the facts of it. But I think it's important for people to at least try. I mean, mm -hmm. if you watch intervention before, you need to go to that person with a list of your because what it comes down to is boundaries. And yeah. this is what you're going to put up with it. And it, if if they don't follow, then it's time for you to leave. You know, yeah. and that's such a hard conversation, Anna, because then you're eventually telling someone where it's like, uh, no, I am telling you to leave a person. Or suggesting yeah. it if they're not going to keep if they're going to keep doing that you can't stay around for that yeah yes. so so that's yeah, like that's, that's that's like 20 answers in that one question <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good and that was actually yeah. where i was kind of going with it was when you make that decision it's not to you don't go into it to get that person sober because yeah. in in for people like me and people like you it was never his decision right, yeah, right. what he was doing was legitimately honestly telling you like i i can't commit my life with this going on and if you're out there and you're you're having this in your life right now you you have a loved one that you know or a, or a relationship with someone that's struggling with this it's okay it's okay yeah. to let them find their path alone 
and mm-hmm. you take your own path for your own health, right? And I think it's really important that when you when you go at it, when you go into that conversation, you you know that you're doing it for you and your life. Mm-hmm. Not not expecting them to say, you know, yes, I choose you and not expecting them to actually quit right then. Yeah. Because oftentimes they won't and that says nothing about you or your value. Yeah. It just says that they're they're stuck in their addiction right now and you don't right. want to go down that road, right? Right, 100%. And then again, at that time, it was a perfect storm for me because at the core of it, I already knew I was going to have to give up alcohol, but I was so tired of, I was so tired of the cycle. Like I felt like an 85 year old at 29, like just like mentally, physically, like just beat. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. So, so yes. And then too, I mean, a great book I would love to suggest to your listeners if you are in that, because then that brings up the topic of codependency, mm-hmm. but codependent no more by Melody yes. Beattie. It's, it's like one of my Bibles in my recovery. I have read probably at this point five times. Yeah. Um, I recommend that book highly. Yeah. And I just actually toured a treatment center oh. two days ago. And their sole focus, they help people with bulimia, depression, anxiety, addiction. And she had a, 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 a gamut of different people. She even had a heroin addict that had about a little over 60 days sober. Mm-hmm. And her core message is healthy relationships and mm-hmm. defeating codependency. Mm-hmm. And it's fairly new. And I personally, I don't know if it would work for me coming out of the addiction that I was in to start mm-hmm. focusing on codependency. Mm -hmm. but she's having great results, you know? And I think that it's absolutely like we've talked about. It's, it's about personal development in recovery. It's not just about quitting drugs. It's not just about your foundation of recovery and finding out how you can get and stay sober. It's about, okay, I'm sober now. How do I, how do I live the life I've always wanted to live? Mm -hmm. And one thing that we all want, whether we think about it or not, is we want healthy relationships. We desire healthy relationships as humans were built to cohabitate with other humans, right? Right, right. And the ones that we pick to have in our in our life are very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long how long after that, uh, or did you just you didn't drink from that point on when you met the cat when you saw the cat again? No, no. Didn't drink again. No. So no. the the last night I had the last night I party was the seventeenth. So I I've just always taken the eighteenth as my day one. Totally. Yeah, because I, I was going to go. I wasn't going to go back three days. Like I, you know, I was yeah. detoxing as well and having like a, the, one of the worst hangovers of my life and like sitting there and sweating and living in shame and like thinking of this cat being run over. So I was not going right. to be like, all right, now's day one. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, I actually do it where my sobriety date is the last day I used. Yeah. And people do it. And I remember at the beginning when I picked that sobriety date, I just wanted to get 30 days so bad that I, mm-hmm. I just needed that one extra day. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, and looking at it now, I I used the last day that I used because it was such a deep and dark experience when Mm -hmm. I saw myself in that mirror, sitting on that toilet trying to hit hit a vein. It was just a really, really deep and dark time. Mm -hmm. So last, last day is is the start of my new life. So Mm -hmm. Um, and now you were talking about, you know, you're a cheerleader for women instead mm-hmm. of, you know, shaming or, you know, maybe even like telling them what they need to do. Yeah. But how, what does it mean to you to be a cheerleader instead of what you see in the industry? To be of support and an empowerment and to be like, it's OK. It's OK that you have these feelings and really sit there and listen. And that's a good point, because, you know, there is a thing and it's it's a slippery slope to sit here on where we're sitting to be like, this is what you need to do, you know, and for years and people, when they have like 20, 30, 40 years, you know, you go get into the old timers and just people with long-term sobriety where it was like, well, I did it this way. Well, that's great. That was 40 years ago, you know, because now Adam in the past two years, it's like totally something different of what other people's stresses are compared to what it was 20 years ago. Right. And what worked for you does not mean that it's going to work the same. So I want to be there more of a, a motivating and more of an empowerment for 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 uh, females in their recovery. Because, yeah. uh, you know, it's just it's not the same for everybody. 
you know, Molly might have a husband who's an alcoholic and then Sally is a single woman at 55. Two mm-hmm. totally different types of way of um, of helping women of what they need. Yeah, you know, hundred percent, hundred percent. Something that something that I actually coach, um, you know, families of addicts, and I do this myself in mm-hmm. in most situations. Is I'll ask the person that's struggling, you know, if they want to stop. I don't mm-hmm. ever tell them they need to stop because mm-hmm. usually we know, we just don't know yeah. if we want to yet. Right. And then ask them, you know how what do you need to do to recover yeah because a lot of times addicts know what they need to do mm-hmm. and then they just need someone to you know cheerlead them into mm-hmm. doing what they already know they need to do mm-hmm. i i don't know if i i just got to a point where i felt like i had tried everything yeah i had done the meetings i had done the the mm-hmm. you know the probation and i had right. done the, the right. church and bible study and everything but it got to a point where i actually didn't know and then when I heard someone speak about how he did it, I followed his direction and, you know, got sober. Mm-hmm. And certain situations when I'm talking to someone that is struggling with, you know, IV, heroin and meth addiction, right? Mm-hmm. These, these extremely physically addicting drugs, I am pretty, I'm pretty suggestive of what they should do because, yeah. because it's, it's really, really difficult to stop, but it is possible. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there's there's a whole bunch of stuff to do with it. So yeah. those are the instances where I'll be like, yeah, you should do this, 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 and this, you know? Yeah. And some of them take it. Some of them take it. And it's it feels good. Mm-hmm. And so tell us about uh, like what your coaching program is, like how you're helping these women. And when you're when you're cheerleading them on, what is it, what does that mean to you? Are you asking them questions and then kind of like what I was just talking about, or or how do you find out how to cheerlead them on? Well, I f- well, one good thing is um, to find out kind of what more of a personality type is. This is an instance. I had I had a client who who worked with a sober coach before. OK, mm-hmm. and so she had a little bit of shame coming into then working with another sober coach. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm like, OK, but it's OK then for somebody if they're in the 12 step program to have like three different sponsors. So I was like, you got to find what works for you. Right. And I think people need to understand is. Not every person here who says, I'm going to quit drinking, does it. And then it's like a one and done. You know, this is a continuous journey for people. Yeah. But so perfect example of this client, she was like, I, Courtney, I I can't with the journals. No problem. (laughs) Honestly, because she's like, I just cannot write. I can't do, I can't write this out. This is not for me. Mm. But she loved to sketch and paint. So I said, sketch and paint it out. Use that creative side and do, you know, the the homework prompts that I have, you know, get that out. Even if it's just painting some black paint, like what does that mean to you? You Mm. know, because not everybody is the type of thinker where they're like, "Mm, yeah, let me journal my feelings. Right, (laughs) right. But you can express it through sketching, through you know, through painting, whatever your creative outlet is, maybe it's knitting a sweatshirt. I Mm. don't know, but there, there's power in that, that that's where you cannot treat everybody the same. So really with me is I help people find out their creative outlet to, to help them through the process and to, we work on a bunch of limiting beliefs. Mm. Also with my program, it's a bunch of accountability and support because that is such a missing key with people that they do not have. As I was saying, let's go back to Sally who has the alcoholic husband who does not want her to stop drinking because that's her drinking pal. But she's to the point where she needs something outside of her marriage or I don't know what the other person's name I use, Molly or whatever, but, and then they're, they're a 50 year old single woman who again, does not have anybody there to check in with, to be like, Mm. I'm having an urge today or, you know, meet on weekly zoom calls and to, to listen to like, what is the struggle this week? You know? So it really is tailored to the client, the individual. You know, it's the same, but it's tailored to the person. So I can't sit, I can't sit here and be like, well, week one, we go over the ABCs (laughs) and because then too, it's just like, 
because then you got to work on self-sabotage. There's so much and you have to figure out somebody's why somebody self-sabotages. Mm-hmm. And it usually goes back into a little bit of some some childhood issues and then holding on to that limiting belief and making a new mindset and just really guiding someone through those first 30, 60, 90 days. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. I love it. And that's that's what I've experienced in in coaching also. Mm-hmm. especially with this course uh, with recovery speaker mm-hmm. because I'm I'm doing coaching calls with it and I have a very specific curriculum very yeah. specific curriculum for how to get your story out how to put it together in a mm-hmm. message and do all this stuff but when I get on coaching calls with people the amount of stuff that comes out when you are working on anything for yeah. personal development right the results the results of the course are the results Right. But when you're working on something that is to empower yourself and to improve yourself, mm-hmm. you have to let go of so many different things, so many areas within yourself that sometimes you don't even know about. Mm-hmm. And I've I've recognized that each person that I'm coaching has different things that need to happen in order mm-hmm. to share their story, in order to really get up there and powerfully do it. Yeah. And I love how you're how you're basically you're helping women through the through the process of getting sober and finding mm-hmm. life in recovery. You yes. said you you help them find their creative outlet. Mm-hmm. Why is it that you that you use that as a tool to give them like something that they are creative with to do to have as an outlet? Why do you pick that? Well, one, it, because art therapy is life. <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> honestly, two, it gives them something to do besides drinking. Three, when you're in that mindset of creating something, it could be baking, okay, that you're creating. You're not sitting there thinking about having a cocktail. Mm -hmm. You're actually not thinking at all sometimes. And it is nice. And that's the thing, too. It's like, you know, I, I believe, too, of not overwhelming yourself and burning yourself out on all recovery. Like, you can't listen to 25 sobriety podcasts in a day and then at the end of the day, you're in with your own thoughts. Like I'm a firm believer of you take some time for yourself, read another book, like read a book, watch a murder mystery. I don't know. You know, (laughs) like, it's just like, you have to, at some point stop that. Right. So it's just really with the the creativeness and finding what brings them joy. It's because Mm. it's going to create new routines and habits for themselves. They're replacing a healthy habit with an extremely unhealthy habit and drinking right. for a lot of women becomes it's it's habit. I mean, for everybody, but that's how it started for some people, you know, for me, it started off very innocently. I was 19 years old and I live in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. You could go over to Windsor and drink. That's the legal drinking age. And it was like, love it first sip at that bar. And <laughs> I will never, I will never forget that. And so it started off as like, all right, this is what 19 year olds do. And then it turned into something dark. But there's women who at 40 years old start picking up drinking because maybe they are, you know, their last kid went to high school or they had some type of traumatic event or they went through a divorce. And then this drinking became more and more and darker and darker and darker. Right. Yeah. And I I think that, you know, everybody that has that, that, you know, late stage, maybe of drinking or or even drug use, right? Yeah. I believe, have you found that someone can start up later on and have the same kind of uh, disempowerment around it, like the same kind of like addiction as if they would have started at a young age? Or do you think? Uh, Yes. Yeah. I do. I do. Because it's like, I do to answer that question. Yes, I do. Yeah. I, it I, just, I, I, it looks, it looks differently and then it sounds differently. Yeah. You know, especially to like a, a lot of women it would post divorce. That's mm-hmm. one thing too. There's such a low self-esteem because then you wonder too of like, you feel like a failure too in your mm-hmm. marriage and you broke up the family and why didn't it work? And, or post, I've seen this and worked with this post-divorce, it's like women go bananas and they go wild because they were caged for so long. And then they're like, let's party, move it up. I've been with this prick for 20, 25 years. I am single and ready to mingle. And then that turns (laughs) into something dark. I I mean, it's all situational, but it all comes out the same with the same type of issue. And that is a problem with alcohol. 
Yeah. And guys, we're going to take a quick 30 second break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about how she founded National Sober Day and everything she's doing with that. See you in just a second. What's up, family? I hope you're enjoying this episode as much as I do when I'm making them. And guys, if you are getting value from this, if you've heard any golden nuggets that you think other people should hear, make sure that you're sharing it with your groups or your pages so other people that are looking for a message of hope are able to find it. Also, in case you weren't here for the beginning of the show, if you have a recovery story and you want to learn how to add impact and income through sharing it, follow the link in the pinned comment to book your one-time, 100% free call with me where we're going to strategize exactly how you can share your story and do just that. Enjoy the rest of the show. Keep living Recovered on Purpose. All right. Awesome. And guys, that's that's I love doing these calls. I've been having like three, four, five, six a day right now. And your stories are so amazing and they're so different. Everybody says that, you know, in, especially in the fellowships, when I, when I went in there and I actually have this, this tattoo on the back of my neck, that it's the Aquarius sign. But the reason why I got it was that it's also the approximate sign, like not, not exactly equal, but like approximately this, because I believe we all have this, this, you know, common problem with drugs and alcohol this common thing where we we can't stop using drugs and alcohol at some point and we have a common solution but that doesn't mean that all alcoholics are the same and all addicts are the same and you know which which i've heard a lot of different you know communities talk about i just don't believe it and it's been proven to me time and time again and especially on these calls is that you guys have incredible stories that all have a different message that come out and i would love to hear from you guys so courtney what is what happened with this National Sober Day and how did that come about and what is it doing now? Uh, it came about because I actually was watching a reality television show where because that's how I decompress at night. I'm a huge Bravo <laughs> fan and there's no shame in that. Um, <laughs> so so I was watching the show and this and this chick founded a uh, national holiday and I was sitting there thinking and it was like at 10 o'clock at night and I was like, oh, my God, is there a National Sober Day? Because I know that there's a National Margarita Day. I know there's a National Vodka Day. You know, there's 420. There's National, what, you, you know St. what Patrick's I mean? St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, like there's all of, you know, oh, the day after the Super Bowl. It's like right. the number one hangover day, the night before Thanksgiving. So, so I'm thinking, I was like, okay. So the next day I went into the website and I checked it out and I, I submitted it. And the woman came back to me like two days later. She was like, there's not a national sober day. And what like a fantastic idea, you know, like being an entrepreneur, you have these ideas that come yeah. to you in some way. Yeah. So um, I founded it because I do believe in a balance of, of, of living and also to the fact that there needs to be more and more and more awareness of the celebration of sobriety. Mm that there are millions of people out there living a sober life. There needs to be more awareness to addiction and, re and recovery, right? And any way for, you know, maybe possibly on that day for a family member or a friend to step up and be like, you know, even not everybody who drinks has a problem, but just them to step up and support a loved one in sober living and be like, you know what, I'm not going to have anything to drink. Like, let's do something fun. This is your day just i'm here to support you so it's really just a more of a national awareness of, of ending a stigma awesome. because there's such stigma and also adam a lot of people who are not who aren't connected in an instagram sobriety re community or who are aware that these shows exist right. maybe hearing that you know, to be like, what is this? And then could do a little research and a deep dive then to put them into a community where they can connect with someone because they've been struggling for years yep. and battling addiction for years, but didn't want to talk about it because they still think that, you know, there's only one way to recover and nobody talks about it. And like, how dare anybody have an issue with drugs and alcohol in 2022? Right, <laughs> right. So, and so what's the what's the actual date of Se National Sober, Sober Day? September 14th. I chose that day because uh, September is National Recovery Month. Mm -hmm. And then September 14th, I have both my grandmothers passed away on that day, uh, wow. separate separate years. 
and one actually quit drinking because her first grandchild was was to be born. I, I will get really emotional talking about this, but so she quit drinking because she had a problem. And then my other grandmother gave um, 35 years as a volunteer in the American Red Cross. So I just want to honor Amen. them. Amen. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. And what was the year it was founded? Uh, 2019. 2019. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And what do you do on National Sober Day yourself? What do you do for the community? What do you do for your community? And how do you how do you get it out there? Well, so, the, okay, so 2021, because uh, my son was being, his due date was in September, and I was like, I can't do this, because my luck, like, he, I will go into labor. <laughs> this. So 2020, I did a virtual event, right, because mm -hmm. then we were in, entered into pandemic times. So then in 2021, I just released that virtual event on the podcast. You know, in 2019, there was a live event in California. So I'm hoping I'm, I'm in the works with an organization right now um, for this year. But the following year for 2023, I'm definitely going to have like a blowout party. I've been wanting to do this for years in Detroit, have speakers go. lined up, like, you know, party, party hard. So let's go. I love yes, it. Exactly. I love it. You're going you're gonna to have to come. Yeah, I would love to be there. Love I to be have there. to come and speak because I want to have a couple speakers. So in person. So let's go. Let's yeah. go. I'm always down to come speak and and <laughs> share share sobriety, share recovery, and share. I love to get up and you know get people encouraged and empowered in their recovery. You know, mm -hmm. the some of the mm -hmm. best speakers that I've ever heard in recovery, like in the fellowships or wherever else, they focus on the person in the room that just needs to be lifted up. Mm -hmm. And it's and it goes for everybody. You can be in your addiction or you can be 25 years down the road, but there are ways to speak to people where it touches all of them to get up and go. Right. Yeah, right. And I just I love speakers that do that. And that's who I aspire to be. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's tapping into a feeling, you know, it's not you don't remember what they say. It's how they said it and how they made you feel sitting yes. there where it's like, oh, my God, I left this to be like. I am going to go kick ass and take names after this event, you know, so I, I hear that and that. So I definitely think that you have that gift. Thank you. Um, <laughs> tell me about, we were talking about it a little bit earlier and you were at the beginning of your recovery, you were doing the fellowship things and doing the 12 step thing. It wasn't really working for you, but you created your own community and you said that you needed that. Mm -hmm. And now you're about to get 10 years of recovery so how did that kind of tie into your long-term recovery and your ability to stay recovered? Um, well, th so I, I actually, in the beginning of my recovery, I, I did a couple AA meetings again that it was very hard for me. My anxiety was at a hundred. The word God freaked me out. Uh, you know, it was a lot. It was yeah. just a lot to process. And so then year three, I went back and I participated in AA for a summer and I sat at a woman's table because that's where I felt safe um, at. And yeah. I sat and I listened and I listened, you know, and I'm like, there needs to be something more for women mm. besides just this. So and I needed it. Yeah. I needed empowerment. I needed a little bright and happier of like, no, this isn't doom and gloom. Like this shit, like, come on. We yeah. didn't just get sober to go to meetings and go to work and then not have it, not be able to participate in life because I heard from a lot of women. And when you sit there and actually listen to somebody of what they needed, and it was more of these women were saying like, God, I wish I could just go to a Tigers baseball game with people. You know what I mean? And not, not feel, and feel safe of not yeah. wanting to drink. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's just yes. like, it's, it was that where I was like, Oh, the, the tide has got to turn here yeah. of, of this is what like being able to say, fuck yeah to somebody, you can do that. <laughs> you can go and you can take your ass to a tiger's game and enjoy life. Or you can take yourself to a restaurant. Like, let's work through the triggers. Let's, let's be a little bit changing of the mindset here and really empower yourself. And I needed that at that time too, you know, cause again, it was three years in. I really think that early recovery and sobriety is like five years. Right. <laughs> There's a lot. I'm coming up on five. I've got, I've got what, three months and 10 days. So I've got five years. I yeah. hear something, I hear something miraculous happens at five years. Is that right? I will like know everything or something. 
Uh, I mean, <laughs> it, it comes for me personally at five years, I had like a midlife crisis at 35 years old because it was one of those things. I was like, okay, I'm 35. I just turned five years. Like, w- what do I do next? Right. Mm-hmm. Like that was where I was at. So, um, but five years, it's, there's a lot of learning and growing that you do in those five years, because what happens at year one isn't the same thing that happens at year three. There's other stuff that you're processing it. And then it gets into like, you know, year two, you're like, huh, all right. I just got done with my first year of sobriety. Like now what? And looking at things like, Oh, my family dynamic isn't as cool as I thought, or, Oh, these friends that I have are a bunch of morons. Like, you know what I mean? You, 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 you do the great awakening or, I really hate my career. I cannot believe I went to school and like, this is what I'm doing. And I'm stuck in a cubicle staring at a wall. Right. So there's just a lot to impro- to process those first five years, but that's not to deter anybody of it because it's still worth it. Nice. But I'm just saying like, I think the early sobriety and recovery is those, those core first five years. Yeah. So again, it was just sober vibes is something that I created and I needed and it's played a part of being able to be in a community with like-minded women. Mm-hmm. And then what happens when you start building that, then you see new people coming in. Mm. This girl, I just congratulated a girl who just turned five today. And I remember to to the T of her journey starting. And this is just in the Sober Vibes Facebook group. Yeah. Of her using that Facebook group to be accountable and mm. asking for help and leaning in on this group of women and women surrounding her and helping her. And now just her posting on her Instagram today, how she just celebrated five years. I mean, come yes. on. And that's, that's one support that this, this woman used yeah. one support, an online Facebook group, you I know? So, it. so it's just, it's, it's a real honor to be on the other side of, of, reading these stories, help yes. posting women, you know, I love when I get previous clients who just like, who will text me and be like, I'm so happy to be clear minded. You know, it's, it's all of that. All I of love that. it. I mm-hmm. love it. That's exactly why I started this page. Also exactly mm-hmm. why I started the, the recovered on purpose show. The page is to reach those out there that may not know about recovery at all might mm-hmm. not know about the 12 steps at all i've yeah. i've received i can't even tell you how many people have hit me up saying i, I randomly saw your show or i randomly saw this this post you did mm-hmm. and you know i'm struggling and they tell me the city that they're in they're like what do i do right like have you ever heard of you know a fellowship no what is mm-hmm. that you know never even heard of of a 12-step fellowship to go look for you know to start a path of recovery right mm-hmm. and i've also found that you know, like we were talking about before, there's a there's a lot of different pathways to recovery. Mm-hmm. And when someone hits me up like that, I'll give them like, I always give them the fellowship. I always yeah. tell them how to look for uh-huh. fellowships because that's a really good first step to take to start the recovery journey, right? Yeah. Just to start getting like, you know, that stuff in your head about, you know, about recovery, about other people have done right. this. It is possible, you know, so maybe it's possible for me. And when we're going into that and, you know, that helps me. like. I've, I've found that when I'm online and people are reaching out and I'm helping people online, it's absolutely part of the spiritual principles that we live in the 12 steps anyway, mm-hmm. because we're out there and we're carrying the message. We're trying to get, you know, the message out to more addicts and alcoholics. And the point of us doing it on Instagram and Facebook or TikTok and all these people that are blowing up with these messages mm-hmm. is to reach the one out there that doesn't walk into the room. Yeah. Because without us doing this, you know, I was I was avid with the with the meetings and I love my fellowships. I love mm-hmm. everybody that's in recovery and I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Right. But what I found is that I wasn't able to help the amount of people that I wanted to help by sitting in a room waiting for addicts to come in. Yeah. And I, I had to get out and do something else. I had to get out and mm-hmm. do more to serve more people. Mm-hmm. And have you found that it's been like, has that been what really kicked you off and really keeps you on purpose and recovery and just staying recovered? Do you have a feeling like, like, do you call yourself recovered or in recovery? 
Um, well, I did call my website recovered because it just sounded better. Courtney recovered.com because <laughs> Courtney Anderson was taken. Uh, but I mean, I, I think it's a continuous now. I don't really, you know, if someone asked me like, do I drink? I said, no, I'm sober. I don't drink mm-hmm. alcohol. You know, if you would like to know the story, I'll feel free to tell you, but <laughs> just that, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a constant state. I think everybody lives in a constant state of recovery because mm-hmm. just because, you know, you quit drinking or quit drugs and then it's like, okay, you figured out like you, you're living comfortably, but then two, three years in, you realize there was maybe some family stuff going on and some trauma that's coming up and then you have to work on that you know it's never recovery is never a destination it's it's a continuous it's it's a continuous process and it's a continuous road so you know that's just how i I, yeah and the way that i look at it and the language that i use and why i use mm -hmm. it is I'm recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind, body, and spirit yeah. where I could not stop using drugs. There was nothing I could do. I was completely hopeless. There was I had tried everything, and then boom, I found a solution. I mm-hmm. found a solution that worked. Mm-hmm. Um, on day 26, my obsession and craving to use drugs and alcohol completely left, and it hasn't come back. I've had mm-hmm. like stupid little thoughts that come by like, oh, it would be nice to go shoot heroin and be homeless right now so you don't have to worry about all these things that you're working on, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of stupid thought. But nothing about obsessive, like, I want to go use and I need to figure out figure out how to do it. Yeah. And what you were what you were talking about there is, is all personal development. Mm-hmm. And what I believe about the recovery community is that we can live after addiction mm-hmm. and we don't have to be working on recovery for the rest of our life because we recovered and we can just progress. We can grow here. We can grow here. We can grow here. Right. And there was, there was something that came up a little earlier that I wanted to, wanted to bring up because um, you know, when people ask you, Oh, you don't drink or, you know, something like that. My first experience with going out to a club in my sobriety Mm -hmm. was um, like mid or early last year, I got Mm -hmm. invited out to this wedding in Pennsylvania and it was like this big, this really, really wealthy family wedding. And mm-hmm. we went out to the club and there was like 10, 15 of us and got a table and everything and everybody's drinking. And I'm just like kind of partying. Yeah. But what sucked was that the entire conversation for the rest of the night, mm-hmm. people were asking me about my sobriety and asked me, oh, like you don't drink at all, like not even one or like, and like asking me constantly and constantly and constantly. And like, it made it so it was hard for me to even like enjoy the night because yeah. I couldn't be part of. Yeah. And I just so happened to be wearing a shirt that I made like legitimately for this. Yeah. And I uh I made these shirts. I don't drink because I'm allergic to alcohol. Yeah, I break I out break of out heroin. heroin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, but then there that's the thing, okay? Because we were talking about this like of being of service. You know, I've had to check my ego and being like, am I doing this for the help? You've had, you have to ask yourself that and you have to check in with yourself as sometimes like, yeah. I want to make sure that it's not the number game that it's of being a service and being alignment of, yes. you know, what matters. And I've asked myself this. I actually had a, a interview with, with another podcast host who was saying that, you know, She's like, oh, we all want to be Joe Rogan when it comes to the podcast. And I was like, no, but I don't want to be him. Like, I, that's not what I'm, a, I, I, I had to stop and think that, like, is that? Yeah. But I was like, no, you know, I don't think that having, I, I think being aligned with a being of service and continuing to do this work because there is every day somebody battles. Yes. And every day. And that is what has pushed me because, you know, and I'm like, sometimes it's like, uh, this is tiresome some days, you know what I mean? Like to be self-motivated and like continue to talk. I know you do a lot of shows. Like sometimes it's like, I don't want to talk today. Right. So it's just (laughs) like, but then you get a message saying for somebody like, oh my God, episode 85 really helped me or your, your Instagram page or even your your uh, 30 day sober not born calendar like it's really yes. helped me 
Yes. I'm struggling today and I press play on your podcast or like you get messages like that and you're like, damn. Yes. You know, it is very impactful in that people do struggle and come in and out of sobriety and recovery. And, you know, some people, they might quit heroin, but then they go actively and get develop a huge drinking problem because mm-hmm. then it's like cross addictions. You know what I mean? Like, it's just... Yeah it's a slippery slope for everything. And I just think education and awareness is key and more people need to talk about it. Absolutely. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's part of why, cause you were, you are talking about earlier, like when, when we have a little bit of a different personality with how we share our stories, because mm-hmm. you know, you, you offer like, yeah, I'll, I'll share it with you if you want to know, you know, but within five seconds of meeting me, you probably know that I was homeless and a heroin addict five years ago because what I, like, I just, I love to like what it's done for me to do that. Right. To make it part of my life, to let people know that I, that I overcame this thing that is killing so many people. It's mm-hmm. killing so many people. And 47% of American adults have someone they love in their life right now that is struggling with addiction. So what I've found by, by constantly just like always that's my introduction mm. is I have those conversations and I open up that space for that person to let me know how it's affecting their life. Or, mm-hmm. you know, if they're the other 53%, they can just be like, great, bro. That's, that's amazing. Like, good for you, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, but sometimes, you know, the, the yoga instructor at the front desk, you know, that I randomly just told my story to starts crying and walks around the counter and hugs me and lets me know that her husband just got 10 years today, you know? Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. something like that, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why I'm all about, you know, being loud and proud. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I wear, I'm always wearing my recovery, always wearing mm-hmm. my brand. Mm-hmm. And I do believe, like you were saying, we need to be loud and proud about it. It needs to mm-hmm. be more. We need to talk about it more, have more, you know, events and more things, people out there doing this. Mm-hmm. My oh vision. My yeah. Imagine, imagine if there were 10,000 you and me's or or you know all of these people that are doing the recovery stuff the mm-hmm. podcast and things like that and there's there's quite a few right now mm-hmm. but imagine if that was like a norm for people that got in recovery to spread their message like that and like this mm-hmm. how many people out there struggling wouldn't be able to find that message right, right. wouldn't be able to find hope right you know? no i 100 but and then that's the thing too there's like another flip side of you know there are a lot of sober and recovery podcasts, but then there's also people who stop doing it because they don't want to talk about it anymore, right? Like yeah. they have moved, they have moved on and want to focus on something else, which I see. But it is you. It, there needs to be a constant awareness of it. But don't get it twisted, Adam. I did used to share my story a lot to people, but now of you know being in the time that I have, yeah, I just and I have learned with myself of because I overshared not with just of that, but just like in general. And that becomes with like, with a person with who doesn't have any boundaries or a people pleaser, Mm. me that I used to just like overshare too much. So that's what I've really worked on in the past couple of years. (laughs) Just being like, okay, you want to know, I'll tell you, but I'm not just gonna, I can't just throw it from shoot from the hip. I love it. I love it. And, and so what do you think? And that's, that's actually something that I've, that I've put together. The reason why I do it, really quickly Mm -hmm. is I have it scripted (laughs) like I like it's the same time every single time I do it it's the almost the exact same words right Mm -hmm. but um tell us about because it says that you're an author right tell us about the Mm -hmm. book and tell us about why you wrote it and what it's there to do for people well, I'm in the process of writing it. So mm-hmm. I actually do have an ebook that I, I put out in 2020, and it was the um, Ultimate Guide to Sobriety, answering really some topics of a person's first year of sobriety. And then, and this is also too why I'm not doing National Sober Day huge this year, because I have a book that needs to be due by the end Let's of October. Go. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. So um, I had a publishing company reach out to me via Instagram. And if you're listening right now of just anybody, the power of this platform and the power of social media, if you do it right, like you never know who's watching. And, mm. and this editor told me she had been watching me for a couple couple uh, months. But when she reached out, I, I said, are you catfishing me? 
(laughs) (laughs) And she laughed. She was like, nobody's ever asked me that. But uh, so the book is going to actually be um, coaching somebody their first 90 days of sobriety. Uh, When we went back and forth, me and the, in the editor, I said, look, I don't want to just put my story out. You know, I feel like I I want uh, this first book to be somebody where they can have some type of uh, tangible of, of, how they really can work through that. You know, if you cannot afford coaching or, you know, if you're just wondering where you should start and how it's going to look and feel to you and, and, and me guiding you through it. Um, So, and then that's going to come out in spring of 2023. So, and again, but this is the gifts of sobriety, Adam. Since I was a little girl, I always wanted to, I, it was always in, I was like, I always want to write a book. Mm -hmm. I want to become an author. Okay. So, and then shit, it happened. Amen. (laughs) It had, you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't have happened if I was still in my addiction, never would have happened if I was still drinking and living on top of pig mountain. Like I was like, it just would not have happened. And in the gifts that come, you know, and it's one of those things for anybody of sobriety. It's like, you can do whatever you want. You want a podcast, do it. You want, you want to be some CEO. You want to get married and have a family. All of this stuff is possible in sobriety and recovery. And also too, of really, you want to love yourself more. You are going to love yourself more in the process of it. So like anything that you have dreamt about, you can achieve in sobriety. Yes. Because you have you have to let go of what was holding you back, and drugs and alcohol stunts growth and holds you back from anything that is possible. Yes, amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And something, yeah, that's that's an amazing point, and that's something a way that I kind of talk about that, and especially with the with the fellowships and the twelve steps mm-hmm. is, you know, for so long in my life, even in my addiction, when I was sticking a needle in my arm, I was working on personal development. I was mm-hmm. coached by, you know really high level people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I couldn't stop using drugs, though. So it was like, I could never finish anything. Mm -hmm. Like the coaching programs that I did the, you know, the personal development things, the landmark education and all this different stuff. I could never actually get to the finish line because I almost felt like a fake. I felt like a fraud because here I am going like, one time I was I was recognized at this conference for it was a uh, inner, uh, introduction leaders program and I was out in New York and there was like 350 people there and you know they they gave me a thing on stage it was a dude with like a with a with a uh, parachute Mm -hmm. as a little award for being up to the biggest things and then right when I left there I went to the streets and found heroin in New York and then I and then (laughs) I don't know if I should say this but I did it on the plane on my way back home (laughs) oh my god Please do. Yes. Yeah, I did it. On you the can't plane. sneak heroin on the planes. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I just felt like a fraud and I was never able to finish anything. And then when I dedicated my life to first, at first, I dedicated my life to recovering mm-hmm. 100% to recovering. When I finished the 12 steps and I had that spiritual awakening that I didn't want to drink or use anymore, mm-hmm. I felt that feeling of completing something of my own power, like a, with God, my own power, my own decision to do it for the first time. And that actually set me up to be able to write the book, mm-hmm. to be able to create a course, to be able to launch a podcast, to do all these things. So I'm forever grateful to my recovery foundation. Mm-hmm. It teaches us so much. Yes. But guys, if you're out there listening, use that foundation for a foundation. And mm-hmm. now let's build our houses on top of it. Mm-hmm. There's so much to do here. And I know you came here with with the gift for everybody. And if anybody is struggling out there with alcoholism, do you, did you have something you wanted to give to them? Yeah, I mean, I have. Uh, it's my 30 day sober, not boring calendar. I created it. So it's 30 days and each day there's something to do. And the reason why I created Adam, because I had to Google hobbies when I got sober because I had none. I mean, this yeah. is the reality of the situation. And again, allow yourself to use humor, a part of your recovery tool. My husband, and I still laugh about it to this day because I remember him being like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm Googling hobbies. I'm trying to figure out something to do because all I did was drink and go to work. Yeah, That was my life. I did not know anything else to do other than drink, 
work, be in a hungover spiral and just be a sloth. And um, so I created that and, you know, it's helped people and, and it just really kind of flips your mindset of like, okay, I can do this because you're going to look at the calendar and you're going to be like, oh, this is stuff I did drinking. But when you flip it around in your head, like, no, empower, empower you to do this with alcohol. And for some people, it's a, it's a stepping point at day one, day, day five of just giving them something to do in their sobriety. Because also, too, in those early couple months, you do go through what's called post-acute withdrawal syndrome, pause. And your brain is very foggy and your body has to rest. And there's a lot of healing physically and emotionally that goes involved. So I also wanted just to give that to somebody to take the thinking out for you. And just like here, day five, read a book. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You know, just, just kind of a guide just to help you out. So where would they find it? uh, You can go to CourtneyRecovered.com. And then just find the 30 day um, calendar. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So this is it guys right here. Whoops. That is not it. (laughs) Cause I have a typo, but I did want to ask you though, um, when you were getting coached by high levels, did any of them once say to you, like I see through your, your BS. Oh my gosh. So, (laughs) No, it is mind blowing what coaches are able to do. It is mind blowing. Right. The, have you, have you heard of the book? Unfuck yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he was my coach, Gary John. Yeah. Yeah. While he was, while he was writing that. Okay. And our first call within three minutes, he knew, knew. I love it. He knew within three Mm -hmm. minutes. And he was like, and the whole thing was that he was there with me you know, and we were trying to work on things, but there was no integrity in it because Mm -hmm. I couldn't follow through. I couldn't, I couldn't do the plans that we were making. I couldn't do it because my addiction would make it. So I couldn't follow through with this stuff. And, but he knew three minutes in and we would try to do a little bit of coaching around addiction, but he was, he was respectful about, Mm -hmm. you know, the power of it and knowing that, you know, heroin and IV drug use is not always something that can be coached out of somebody's very, 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 um, I'm going to say almost never. Yeah. If it ever right. happened, I don't know. Right. Right. But there's help that can be had. And yeah. he was with me. I mean, he kept coaching me when I was homeless. He, uh, yeah, I'm very, very grateful for all the coaches that I've had in my life. Okay. And he, he's a life changer there. Yeah. I had, a, I had a therapist before I quit drinking, like, you know, like a year before and she, and I loved her. And then she, there was a couple uh, sessions. She was like, do you ever think about giving up alcohol? And I'm like, no. And then I fired her soon after. Because I was like, <laughs> dude, she was she was on to me. Like, she figured it out. And I was like, no, we're not going to go there. And then I was like, there's no point of wow. therapy anymore. You know? But yeah, yeah pe- people sniff it out. They get it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And Courtney, I appreciate you coming on so much. Uh, this was a great conversation. Thank you for the free gift also, guys. If you're out there and you're you're in your early recovery, or if you just want to learn how to make some habits in your recovery now, wherever you're at, you know, habits or hobbies and that kind of stuff, go ahead and go to CourtneyRecovered.com and pick up your free copy and you can connect with her there. Love you guys so much. Keep living recovered on purpose.